Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to a kind of new experience for Lupus LA. We're calling this News from the Lab. And um, I'm Adam Selkowitz. I'm the chairman of Lupus LA. Thanks for joining us today. And Caroline Jeffries, uh, Dr. Caroline Jeffries is uh, one of the foremost researchers in the lupus world these days. And um, we have a paper that just came out, a new paper. It's really extensive. I'm going to read you the title um, and then we're going to find out what it all means um, to our lupus community. Um, first, I should start out full, full disclosure. Uh, some of this research was actually paid for by a contribution from the Selkowitz Family Foundation. So uh, for me personally, this is really exciting because it's the fruits of our labor here and, and um, it's sort of like an investment paying off. So um, let's talk about the article, Dr. Jeffries. It's called Neutrophils Contribute to ER Stress in Lung Epithelial Cells in the Pristane Induced Diffuse Alveolar Hemorrhage Mouse Model. Right? So, I, so I, what I'm hoping is off the already, this, you know. Right? In the end of this 15, 20 minutes, we're all going to know what that means. So, <laughs> um, so, tell us a little bit about maybe we should start back with kind of how this came to fruition. Well, first of all, I'm going to say thank you to your family's foundation for funding the work because, you know, with those sort of with those that sort of funding, we're able to do Blue Skies research, which is where this came from. So we appreciate that hugely. Um, now, where did this come from? Well, that's a that's kind of a very good question. I suppose my lab has been working on understanding why the immune system is overactivated in lupus, and and that's something anybody suffering with lupus knows about, right? That your immune system is acting as if it's constantly on. And what it's trying to do, and you know, for whatever reason, is actually it thinks that there's a virus there, and it's constantly trying to fight a virus. And we're all aware after COVID what happens when you're trying to fight a virus, right? So your immune system gets kicked on, um, you get T cells activated, and we've all heard about T cells and B cells and antibody responses from you know our our kind of uh, whirlwind immunology 101 thanks to COVID. And the other thing that happens during all of this is that your body starts to produce proteins called interferons. And these guys basically work on the cells of your immune system on, on throughout your body, basically, to try and combat a viral infection. And so for a lupus patient, you've got all the signs and symptoms of having a virus. You're achy, you're tired. And the other thing is, is that your immune system starts attacking things. And that's where the autoimmune part of things um, comes into it. And so um, the interferons can attack so many, different, so many different tissues. And one of the tissues that can be involved in lupus, although not commonly, is the lung. Um, and we've been very interested in understanding how interferons might drive lung inflammation. Um, and so this is where this paper came from. So basically, we were starting to under, try to understand how neutrophils, which is part of that title, these are your first, these are the cells that are activated first in any infection. And they constitute about 40% of all your immune cells in your blood. So there's tons of them. And for years, we've ignored them and we've not been very interested in them. But recently in lupus, we've discovered that actually these guys are the source of um, the stimuli that drive interferons. And so we're very interested in them. And so what they do when they're activated and what they spontaneously do in, loop, in lupus is they burst. They burst open when they get a trigger and they release these nets. And these nets are super, super sticky, but they also have lots of DNA in them. And the DNA basically is what's driving um, the autoimmune disease and interferons. And so now we've got these neutrophils in the lung that have burst open, they're very sticky, but they're driving inflammation. And so we wanted to kind of figure out what effects these neutrophils are having on the lung tissue. And so we took a mouse model, and this is the pristane induced mouse model that's in that title. Um, and we injected it with this oil, we injected the mice with an oil, um, and then basically they develop lung inflammation and what's called alveolar hemorrhage. Um, and we and that's took basically in, bleeding in the lungs, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, and it's a very, very rare um, association or um, pathology seen in lupus, but it's, it's quite devastating. 
Um, and then when it resolves, it basically the patients will end up getting interstitial lung disease and fibrosis because of the constant inflammation that's, that's driven. And that's a feature of not just lupus, but some other autoimmune diseases. And, um, you know, it's potentially all driven by, by um, these neutrophils and mitosis. So what we wanted to understand was whether if we inhibited cells from, or inhibited the neutrophils basically from spewing out all their DNA, forming these nets, could we reduce lung inflammation? And so we crossed our mice, these are just ordinary mice, with mice that have um, a deletion in a protein that basically drives mitosis. And then we did this pristain model all over again, and the mice didn't get lung inflammation. So that's great. So that means mitosis is very, very important for driving lung inflammation. And the next question we had was, well, what are, this, what are the nets working on? How are they doing this? And so we took lung tissue from the mice, and we put the nets on them, and then, then the nets basically drove interferon responses, but they did so by driving a form of stress in the lung epithelial cells called ER stress. And ER stress is you know, a response to lots of different things. Um, but what it can do is it can actually kill cells. And if you've got any cell in the tissue that, that dies, that's going to drive inflammation. So if you have a lot of those cells dying, which is what's happening during mitosis and you know, when these neutrophils are activated, then that's going to drive a lot of inflammation. Um, so basically, you know, the upshot was that you know, by blocking mitosis, you block your stress, you prevent autoimmune lung disease in the mice. And, and so let me ask you this, practically speaking, in a lupus patient with lung issues, how can you, how does that translate? How do you block those uh, exploding nets, you know, in, pra in practical terms? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. And there are a couple of um, inhibitors um, that have been developed uh, by GSK. One, one is developed by GSK that can specifically target these, the production of these nets. They haven't been tried in lupus yet because they've been actually developed to um, fight um, the formation of antibodies that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis. So I think next steps would be to test this, these inhibitors in the model. Um, I'm, sure they're, I'm sure GSK are actively looking at um, you know, using this in lupus because we know neutrophils are very important in lupus. We know nets are driving interferons. Um, you know, I think they probably need more evidence to show that it's not going to be harmful if they they try it in in the lung because there are you know there's potentially other things that this could inhibit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that they're the next steps. And, and what what are the downsides medication. like for for RA patients who take it? What what are the side effects or downsides to it? You know, I, I'm not aware of, um, I, I, they haven't, basically they're in phase two clinical trials right now and um, the results yeah. haven't been published. So we're not aware yet of any, any downsides. I suppose, you know, we know, we know netosis is very important for trapping bacteria, right? And so for containing bacterial infection, um, fungal infection. So there's a potential that you'd be more immunocompromised. Um, because your neutrophils yeah. you need to battle all of those. Yeah. So neutrophils, I mean, neutrophils have lots of functions, but one of them is making these nets to trap the back bacteria. But the other thing is, is they're the ones that basically eat all the bacteria. They're the first things if you have an infection, you, your skin is damaged. Um, you know, this is one of kind of your immunology 101 for medical students. The first cells that come to the site of infection are neutrophils, and they basically get there, they wall off the infection, and then they basically chop away and eat everything. And if you have a splinter in your hand and, you know, it's, you, and it's not taken out, you actually end up getting kind of pus um, around the splinter. That's actually all dead neutrophils um, right. that have died trying to get rid of the splinter, which is kind of gross, but kind of a cool fact anyway. <laughs> well, I'll never look at a splinter the same way again. So, um, all right, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about sort of the practical uh, aspects of this research. I counted there were 14 uh, people involved in writing this article or oh, putting okay. together this research. Yes. That's, so <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm always curious when you see these articles, 
and you see all these people, how do you all work together? What's the, what's, how, you know, how does that work? How does that collaboration work? Because I'm a big proponent of collaboration in medicine and research. And I'm, I mean, I love seeing, you know, half of these names are on the Lupus LA Medical Advisory Board, which is we're very proud of, but yeah, how does that come together? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, the work starts in the lab and, you know, uh, I, there were five and actually it spanned, let me see, it spanned four years. It took four years to go from the initial idea um, to getting the work initially, eventually published. So in that four years, I've gone through probably two teams and there've been two different teams of scientists that have been involved in that work. So they all go on the paper. And then uh, the other side of it is the clinical side. So we also looked at some of uh, these pathways in lupus patients and lupus patient cells. And so the clinicians that are involved in recruiting patients for the studies, um, so Dan Wallace, you know, uh, Lindsay Forbes, you know, all those, clini clini all those that are involved in um, lupus LA, they all basically provided the patients. Um, and so we have a very active collaboration with rheumatology at Cedars, but, um, and also with, with Dan Wallace at Attune. And we take patient blood and we look at what their neutrophils are doing and look at what other cells in their immune system are doing. Um, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of translate what we find in the mouse to, the human, to human disease. Actually, my lab is more noted for actually looking at what's going on in the immune cells in the patients, finding out what's going wrong there, and then proving it in the mouse, if that makes any sense. Because sure. I'm going the wrong, I'm going kind of backwards, whereas most scientists go the other way. So let me, because what, what I'm also fascinated with um, is all of the genetic aspects and the DNA and, and all of that um, and how that's being um, pushed sort of light years faster than it used to be. So this research that we're talking about now, would this research have been possible 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or is this part of this new focus on, um, on sort of looking into those single cells and those specific cells and, and. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I think, I think this would have been possible mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's not in the single cell realm. Um, I, we have other work in the lab that's kind of going into more personalized medicine, trying to understand what groups of patients are going to be doing, you know, are going to respond be best to what treatments. So there's a new treatment um, out that was approved last year for lupus, which I'm sure you're all aware of, which is anifolumab or um, Safnello, I think it's called, and it's from AstraZeneca. Um, and basically it's targeting these interferons but only some patients are responding to it. And, you know, we're trying to figure out why other patients aren't responding to it, why the other patients aren't responding to it. Um, so there's all different types of flavors of lupus and certain patients are going to respond better to some treatments, or maybe there's ways we can take what we're learning in the lab to actually restore responsiveness to this interferon targeting therapy. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so it's when, when you're actually talking about the genetic side of it, you know, there's, there's so many different aspects to that. So genes are, you know, what are what make proteins and genes are expressed and turned on when you need them for the most part, like, you know, genes, proteins that are required to fight infection, like the interferons. Um, and how you turn them on is you activate other proteins and pathways that basically drive these genes to turn on or you regulate the accessibility of these proteins to the actual DNA, which encodes the, the, the genes. So it's very, very highly complex. There's so many di different levels of regulation. And I think that's where a lot of the lupus research is starting to go, understanding at the single cell level, but also at, at the individual level, you know, how these genes are regulated, whether, you know, epigenetics, on twi twisting open DNA or closing DNA is basically regulating gene expression and you know, the immune system. There's another aspect that we're also interested in and that's um, metabolism of cells. Mm -hmm. Metabolism is a, a, you know, the way that your cells make energy or they make intermediates to basically drive um, functions or make new cells if they're, if they're dividing. 
Um, and metabolism can impact gene expression. It can regulate whether promoters are open or closed. And uh, we have some really nice new data that we're just getting ready to publish actually, um, that's saying that you know metabolism in a certain subset of cells in lupus is overactivated and it's basically driving the promoters of genes that are important for the immune system to be open. And that means that they can be driven. So you can basically regulate genes by whether they're open or, or tightly, tightly closed. And that's what metabolism is doing in, in lupus patient cells. And so kind of, you know, there's one of the thoughts is that we can use inhibitors of metabolism or change diets even to basically promote open or closed chromatin. So there's, there's a, a lot of different aspects to this. It's, it's really quite cool, actually. Well, yeah, I mean, I know on the practical side, diet is such a huge part of the new thinking about autoimmunity and and um, inflammation and all of that. So, you know, I, I like when things sort of come together, both scientifically and practically. I think that's important. Um, all right, to wrap this up, because I don't want to keep you too long. If I'm a lupus patient with um, with lung issues right mm -hmm. now, um, this paper that is published, how, how excited should I be that it's going to really change my trajectory over the next three, five, 10 years? I think with the development of these new inhibitors that are targeting neutrophils, I think what our work has done is added to the body of work out there that's supporting their use. Mm -hmm. um, and given that neutrophils we know are already really important in driving kidney disease and lupus, um, you know, the, the fact that neutrophils are now, and nets are now caught are pretty much understood to be important in lung disease as well. Um, the, I, I think you should be pretty hopeful that down the road, uh, three, four, three, five years down the road, there'll be something new that can treat your, your lung, lung involvement or your lung inflammation. Excellent. Well, I think that is terrific news, uh, news from the lab, as we're calling this. So this works out well. And I want to thank you, Dr. Jeffries, for um, your continued support of Lupus LA and Lupus Patients. I know I've known you for a long time, and I know that your work really translates and you really focus. You're not just locked up in a lab, not thinking about the patients. And we all really appreciate that. So thanks for joining us. And we'll, we'll do this again soon. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Lucas LA.